G'day guys, I'm here with Eng- England batsman Dav Milan. Uh, we're doing our first ever podcast, so Darby, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I just want to congratulate you on everything you've achieved over the last few months with England in the Ashes, but also over your career. Um, you've come a long way uh, since I was at Middlesex to now um, be playing for England, so well done Darby on everything you've achieved so far. Um, before we get started, I just want to take you back to your childhood. Um, we obviously we have a, a big following um, of, of young cricketers out there. What did your childhood look like? Where did you? What's your earliest memory of playing cricket? Uh, yeah, so earliest memory. My old man was sort of a cricket fanatic. He was sort of obsessed with cricket. So um, you know, it consisted of you know, I was quite fortunate that I have a brother. He's a year and a half younger than what I am. So you know, every opportunity we had would be in the backyard and. We'd be bowling to me, and I'll be bowling to him, and I'll be refusing to walk because I've nicked it, and I'm just being difficult as I was. But um, you know, the the schooling system in South Africa as well, you know, allowed me to be playing a lot of cricket. You know, you trained twice a week plus played, and then every sort of Sunday, my old man would love to get a new uh, new Duke's ball out of his sort of ball bag that he had and uh, try and nick us off every weekend. So um, you know, it sort of became four to five days a week of of cricket, and um, you know, as I said, I was quite fortunate that my brother was into cricket and helped that he was a bowler as well so uh, you know I sort of took full opportunity of that but um, yeah so it was more about playing as much as I possibly could um, and it was more for fun it wasn't more to or in any way or form to be playing international cricket at the time it was just you play for fun it's an outdoor environment it's you know it gets you out of the house it's um, something you can do with your mates and you know a couple of boys next door used to come over and used to have these big backyard games and, and what have you so um, you know it's all about enjoyment in this game, it's all about fun, and if you don't enjoy it, it's pretty pointless playing it. Absolutely. So it was a combination of backyard cricket and sort of structured training sessions. What age did you start playing competitively? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think I was 10 and I started playing for the only 11s in, at the school I was at. I think every year you do two years up in South Africa uh, when I grew up. And then when I turned 11, I started playing for the under 13s, or just after I turned 11, under 13. So it was about then where it starts becoming competitive and you're trying to you know keep your spot in the team and you know with the schools in South Africa it's all if you're in the first team you're sort of seen as really important in the school and you sort of aspire to be that so it sort of creates that competitive nature and the sort of the hunger to want to do well um, you know as long as that doesn't as I said earlier doesn't take over the fun element of, of the game um, but yeah and then as soon as you went to high school it suddenly you go from being 30 guys in the class to 160 or 180 guys in in your year and suddenly there's another 30 or 40 good cricketers that arrive and there's six cricket teams and you know you you want to be playing in 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 your age group in the the best team in your age group and then you have your provincial trials which is the same as your county trials uh, or state trials here um, and you sort of have to play trial games all the time so it's, it sort of starts pretty early and you know you, if you're not in any of those sort of teams it was quite hard to to sort of look for or so, I wouldn't say look for a career in it, but to sort of think about cricket seriously. So, um, you know, under 12, under 13, you're trying to play in the, the PG Bison, which is the big under 13 tournament where all the states go to one sort of province in the country or one or the uh, provinces go to one, one province. And, you know, you have a big sort of week competition where you play five games against different different sort of states, if you want to put it that way. And, you know, they choose the best team for the thing uh, for the for the tournament and then that's sort of how they identify talent around the country and to get onto that you know you've it sort of gives you a bit of a bit of encouragement to want to play and to want to get a bit further in the game and so what point what age do you think you're at where you thought gee I'm okay I'm pretty good here and maybe it is a career or something that I could do professionally uh, I never I, I don't think I ever thought that it could be a profession I've, I've always wanted to, to play international cricket you know I think I got to I think it was about 15 we had a, you know, we had a the under fifteen tournament, and I did really well in that. And you know, suddenly people start talking to you about what are you going to do? Are you going to play cricket or or what have you? And then you know, yeah. And and the tough thing actually about South Africa is that rugby is such a big sport. Um, and the school I went to was, you know, at the moment they've been the number one school in the country for about three or four years. Um, so it's massive rugby culture. I've had a lot of rugby players that played for South Africa, but no cricketers. So cricket was sort of on the up at the school and and they sort of made a few differences and a few changes and a few brought a new few coaches in. So I think it was almost when I turned 16, 17 and you had coaches from outside come in and sort of 
give you sort of a, I wouldn't say a sniff, but they sort of give you a hint that you, there is potential career if you keep working at it. And I think I got to 16 and I started working really hard at cricket. So every opportunity, you know, Fridays and Thursdays after tr cricket training, I'd have another hour hit after after training and Fridays before every game, old man would throw me balls after work and play on the Saturday and the Sunday, he'd go and bowl to me in the nets again. Um, you know, it was really enjoyable for me, which which helped. It wasn't enjoyable. I would hate to be batting on a Sunday after a full day in the dirt on the Saturday yeah. or on the Friday. And, you know, you have to sacrifice a lot. You sort of give up going out with your mates on, on a Friday night because you've got a Saturday and, you know, you finish cricket late on a Saturday and you miss out on the little house parties that all the boys have and you know the the young girls are around when you're when you're 17 18 and you want to have a crack you sort of miss out on that a little <laughs> bit but um you know it's it, it's it's still enjoyable and um you know so i thought about sort of then when i turned 16 that you know i probably want to play want to i wouldn't say i want to play professional cricket but i want to try and play um you know, put as much as I could into cricket. Awesome, and so it sounds like your dad had a big influence. Was there, did you get any private one-on-one -on -one coaching from anyone else, or was it sort of a bit of guidance from your dad and you sort of figured things out yourself? Yeah, my, my dad's always been my my number one go-to. Um, even now, I still get a message if I don't move my feet, you know, you get a sort of silly message saying, move your feet, or get your head in the ball, or what shot was that, or something silly like that. You always get a bit of bit of criticism from the people that you uh, sort of respect the most and you sort of look up to the most so um, uh, yeah so he's always been the one um, when I turned I think I was 18 when I turned 18 he went to a funeral and bumped into Gary Kirsten who just retired and was just trying to do the just starting up the Gary Kirsten Cricket Academy and my old man I think he played with him somewhere before or something and he sort of said to him well look, do you mind taking my son and having a few sessions with him and he was probably my first one-on-one -on -one coach you know you obviously have your school coaches that that help you a lot and they throw you a lot of balls and and do a lot but he was sort of the the main one that influenced my game going forward you know it's always nice to have a a guy that you sort of used to watch as a kid and suddenly you've got this guy that you respect sort of trying to help you and you, it, it, you sort of listen a bit and and it sort of makes you want to get there if that makes sense you listen to the way he speaks and he tells you the stories about you know how he played first class cricket and the odd international game. He, he, well, he very rarely talked about his international stuff, but how he talked about first class cricket and how he broke into first class cricket. And um, you know, I think that was really relevant to me at the time as an eighteen year old trying to do it. And so, between Gary and your father, now are they still your mentors? They're sort of the people that you go to to talk about your game. Yeah, yeah. My old man's been putting his box a little bit. Um, you know, in, when he's sort of telling you to get forward to start ball in 148, it's you know, it's like I haven't seen you face a, a quick bowl before, so I give him a bit of a bit of stick back. But um, yeah, look, I still still get the odd message from Gary if I do well, and whenever I go back to South Africa to visit my parents, if I have two or three weeks, I'll always go and see Gary. You know, he's been a massive influence on my career. Um, you know, is and it is it is nice to have a relationship with someone that you could always go back to, someone that knows your game, someone that you trust, someone that's not going to throw you under the bus for his own own goals and his own ideas. And so, um, you know, I think that's the major thing between a coach and a player is the trust and that they actually want the best for you. Yeah, absolutely. And now, you've you had many years um, up until about twelve months ago or so, I suppose, where you were dominating county cricket. Um, scoring runs for fun and didn't quite get a look in at the next level. How did you sort of stay motivated or keep yourself up to keep improving? Was it always the goal to play, like to the, the carrot to play international cricket that kept you going? It was, yeah. I, I had, it was actually 2013. I had one of the worst years of my career in four day cricket. I don't know how I still played as many four day games as I did for Middlesex at the time, but you know, I managed to play a few too many. Um, and I went away and actually started doing work with Gary again got in touch with him and, and, and did a lot of work and sort of since then my game sort of progressed, you know, simplified it, got me more set onto a way that I want to be and, and, and I started knowing my game a bit more, which I think is obviously important. You know, you're not guaranteed to score runs and you never will be, but if you have a game that you trust and a game that you believe in um, and your game that knows that works, you almost have that self-confidence that you can go and score runs. Um, so, um, yeah, it's... I almost forgot the question. It was what um, did what sort of motivated you to keep getting better? When yeah, you... so um, yeah, and then after that, it sort of started scoring runs more consistently and consistently over over a period of time, and and it sort of started. You started sort of thinking a bit ahead of yourself, and there were times where I sort of look at 
England teams and England players and think, well, I've, you know, I've scored a lot more runs than this guy in county cricket over this amount of time, and he's getting picked. And you know, it definitely got me down a few times. Um, I remember there was a time last year, actually, or well, the year before, I got picked in the 2020 squad and didn't play, and then sort of got thrown out of everything. Didn't get picked in the Lions and didn't get picked in everything. And I sort of sat down in the, the end, didn't really know what I done wrong you know I'd been picked in a squad because I'd performed not played and suddenly was gone and then got an opportunity to play in the North v South uh, beginning of last year um, did really well in that in that I think I averaged 100 in that in those three games in the one day series and then uh, got back and they rested a lot of the main one day players and they re-picked guys that hadn't performed for England for a couple of years who'd been in the squads and not performed and we're averaging 20 or something in, in list A cricket and stuff and I, I remember speaking to Adam Voges, uh, who was the overseas in Middlesex saying, you know what, I've I've just had enough. Um, you know, I've worked my socks off, I get up in the morning and I gym and I run and I do whatever I need to do and I hit millions of balls to try and get to this level and you sort of look at other people just getting given opportunities when, you know, they might be young or they've got talent or what have you, whereas you know, it was sort of getting a bit disheartening that you put in the results on the on the table and you weren't and you know, he sort of just narrowed my focus a bit more and got me back to worrying about what I can control and you know, um, probably about a month and a half later I got picked in the twenty twenty squad and and you know, things have just gone from there. So it's it's amazing how if you you it's amazing how you never know how close you really are. Um uh, you know, and I think it's a lot of times in people's careers where they sort of give up or times in their life where they've just gone, oh, you know what, I've had enough, I'm going to stop working. But if, you know, they did an extra month, an extra two months or an extra six months, suddenly your life changes. And, yeah. you know, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be in that position. Awesome, awesome. And just trying to take you back to when you went back to Gary Kirsten, which you spoke about, you said you simplified your game a bit and you sort of started to know your game a bit better. Can you try and recall what that involved? What sort of game plans did you, yeah. what practice sessions did you work on? So when I was younger, I wanted to play every shot in the book and, you know, I had that bit of arrogance about me that, oh, you know, I can hit you through the covers and then the next one I can hit you through mid-wicket just because I can and because I want to and then, you know, you bowl the short one and I'll try and cut you for four and then I'll pull the next one and then I'll run you down the third man and just you know, almost think, oh, I'm so good, I can just do what I want, and you get a pretty 20 and you hit one straight to cover, or you get caught point trying to cut a ball you shouldn't cut, or you play a stupid shot, and it was about narrowing my focus to what works for me, and to working out what three or four shots come naturally to me, and what my scoring areas really are, um, being more disciplined in the areas where I wasn't as good. Um, so it, it was more just sort of taking the product that I have and just simplifying into into a little bit of a tighter base, I worked on my scoring areas, where I'm looking to score every ball, um, cutting out certain areas which were trouble, so you know, I would nick off a lot because I'd defend the balls and full stump, so I changed the way I defend, so I tried to defend to mid on, which then meant the balls that I was trying to defend to mid off, suddenly they were lead balls, because my, my head and my position and my body was going towards the bowler, so it sort of minimised the risk, doesn't mean you're not going to get out, you're always going to get out, you're always going to have bad runs, you're always going to fail, which is part of the game, It's everyone fails in the game. Um, but it's just trying to minimise the the times or and almost maximising your, your opportunity that when you do get in, there's less chance of you getting out if you stick to your game plan. And I think usually if you get out, a amount of times you can walk off and sit down and go, I sort of went out of my game and there's not many times in a year where you can sort of walk off and go he got me out yeah I think if everyone's brutally honest with each other so you know it was more just that it was more and as I said when you have a relationship with someone that you trust and you respect and you know they want the best for you you can almost buy into what they say um, so yeah so he helped me a lot with that just change my areas sticking to my strengths um, putting away the silly shots and just being happy with being happy with what I've got and being who I am instead of trying to be a Navy de Villiers that can hit the ball all around the, world, all around the ground. Yeah. Now, you've just touched on failure um, and you mentioned 2013, which was a tough year for you. How have you dealt with failure throughout your career? Because you, like you say, it's something that every single cricketer goes through and we often have more bad days than we have good days. As a sort of a coach, I see so many young guys that struggle with failure. They think that if they don't score runs, then they're not a good player. What what advice would you give them, or how, how do you personally deal with the tough times? Yeah, so I, I was exactly the same as those players. I used to sort of get 15 or 20 and get out and sit on my seat and sort of sulk all day and sort of 
I almost stopped enjoying cricket because of it because I was so desperate to do well, I was so obsessed with scoring runs that it it sort of ate away at me when I didn't score when I didn't do well. Um, and as I said, you almost sit in the change room and you sulk and you become moody and you become difficult and you don't really want to, people you people don't really want you around and want you in the team when you become like that. So um, you know, it sort of got to the stage where I realised cricket wasn't everything. Um, it was about trying to find the balance off the field and on the field. You know, I think when I was younger, I was very guilty of just being cricket, 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 and you know, every opportunity was cricket and cricket. And and you know, it, it took me up until I was probably about 25, 26 to work out that you know, cricket is it's a sport. It's something you do for enjoyment. It's it's a bit of fun. Yes, it's your job. Yes, you have to score runs. Yes, everyone's trying to score runs. The bowlers are trying to get you out because it's their job as well. But you know, you can still train hard and have a good time off the field. You can still, you know, go to the cinema, you can go and, you know, walk your dog, you can do whatever you want and you don't have to think about cricket 24-7. So I think when I realised that and I realised that there was more to, to life than cricket, it became a lot easier to accept when when there were failures. Um, you know, it, it is obviously tough if you don't have a lot of, score a lot of runs in, in innings, but, you know, I think I, I sort of started working on the sort of law of averages, you know, you sort of look at your career and you look at your stats, it's easier because everything's documented for us, but you can sort of have a look how many times you score 50 in, in or past 50 in an innings, and you, yeah, you know, I think in some of the, one of the formats, I'm like 3.8 or something, or three and a half times or whatever it was that I passed 50, so I know if I haven't scored runs for four or five innings, I'm due just by the law of averages and I have that confidence that and even if it gets to eight times I know that in the next four or five minutes I might score three fifties because it all evens out at the end of the time so I'm always positive in the fact that it will turn because your averages and your stats say that it will um, without being too stats oriented but it's just a way that I justify going that's all right it's, it's fine I didn't score runs I didn't score runs today I contributed to the team and I think that's another thing that I really looked as well so you know sometimes you get 35 40 and you sit down and you'd be really annoyed with yourself you know you could have pushed on but if you look back at the at the game and go well I've scored 30 I've batted for an hour and a half I had a 60 or 70 run partnership with whoever it was at the other end I got the team into a better position I took time out of the game you know I contributed I think that helped me a lot in sort of realizing that you know, yes, I didn't score the runs I wanted, but I helped contribute towards the team of that day, which then also then puts you in a better place when you're sitting in the team and you're going, well, I've helped today. And do those tough times or those sort of going back and saying, I haven't scored runs for six or seven, haven't got my 50 for six or seven innings, do you think when you get in and you're sort of going well, that helps drive you to say, okay, I've got to make today count, I've got to turn definitely. today into yeah, a Yeah, definitely. Run. You know, it's, <laughs> we, we've touched on it before, you fail more in cricket, you know, I think even Tendulkar failed every two and a half innings that he had. He just didn't pass 50. So for guys as good as that, that that's a failure. So, um, you know, no matter who you are, you're going to fail. Um, and it is it is working out that, you know, you are... Yeah, it, it's tough to say and it's tough to sort of... Well, it's easy to sort of say, well, it will, it will turn and what, and what have you. But if you keep doing your right processes and you keep doing the right things, eventually it will. And, and it's just trusting in that ability. Absolutely. Now you touched on you'd get up early, you'd go to the gym, you'd, you'd do your weights, you'd run, etc. Hit millions of balls, which I, I know firsthand. You being probably hitting more balls than anyone when I was at Middlesex. But what does your sort of daily routine look like? And obviously it changes between where you're at with your with your games and your travel and everything. But what what would a, a week leading into a championship game look like for you? What just to give the listeners and the viewers an idea of of what a pro international player now, one of the world's best players, what you go through to, to get to where you're at. Yeah, so county cricket changes a little bit because it's very unstructured. It's sort of, you know, you you might only have one training day or you might have three training days depending on the schedule. And some of those days you've driven for four hours to get there and then you're suddenly out the car. So it all depends on how you're feeling, what have you. But I, I'm quite routine orientated. I quite like my routines. Um, so I, you know, I like to get a gym session in at some point um, before the day before a game, whether it be a light gym session or it be a depending on where I am, where I'm at, if I've been lazy for a bit of time then I know I've got to work harder at certain times but I try to tick it over as often as possible. Um, so I'll do a, a light gym session where I'll just do all my core and, and, and just my sort of body weight stuff just to get me going and get me fired up and then you know with my, with my batting I know rocking up at a game that if we're going to be playing at Durham 
you know, it probably seem around a bit. So I'll do a lot of a lot of my work will be on leaving and being positive and getting my lines right for the seamers. And if we go and play at Taunton, which turns a hell of a lot now, I'll I'll have a game plan before I rock up for training on the the day before, knowing that this is what I'm thinking about playing spin. So when I face our spinners in the nets, I'll try that game plan and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I can always go back to what I want. But it's always about having an option to score, an option to get enough strike, and it's an option to put the pressure back on the bowler. And you know, so I do a lot of my homework on that, a lot of my homework on the bowlers and who you're going to face, how they get the wickets, what you know, the pass, how I face them, and what they've done to get me out, or how you know, you're quite lucky because you play against bowlers quite a lot, so you can sort of work out what they're going to do and you know what they're going to do and it's about having a plan A to them and a plan B so that when it happens you sort of feel like you can just watch the ball and you can let instinct take over because you've practiced just practice those things so um, so yeah I'd say I'd do that and then in my training I'd, I'd do that a little bit and then I'd just do my normal routine which is making sure I'm hitting the balls in the area that I want um, you know we mentioned about me doing work with Gary and simplifying my game and I'd almost make sure I practice those three or four shots so that I can feel comfortable going again, that if someone gets it wrong, I can score off those areas, which is all batting's about, it's about being confident. So do you do you have a routine where you hit X number of underarms and then you go to a certain pull shot or you go flicker and then spinners, or is it, does it just vary from no, the situation? No, so it's, it's, to... it's all similar. So some days I'll have underarms if I want to work on my running down to spin. So I might start with 15, 20 underarms, just get my feet moving. Um, from around the wicket, as like an off you would bowl or a left arm spinner, and just try and get the pitch and hit my areas. So hit ten to mid on, ten to mid off, ten through mid wicket, ten through the covers. Just sort of get my hands, my body in the position, um, and then I'll go to my. I, I really like someone throwing balls, so I get someone to throw me twenty to thirty dead straight balls, um, crossing dead straight balls, so I can hit the ball back to mid on, and I, I know my weight. For me, as a lefty, the biggest issue I have is if. I start falling across the crease or going across the crease. I bring in LBW, I bring in caught behind. So if I can get my weight going in one position, um, you know, I feel pretty comfortable. And then I'll get someone with a dog stick to try and try and hit me on the head and you know make Shopping a make a decision. A yeah, make a decision whether I'm pulling or ducking it. Um, you know, and it's all about those split seconds and trying to make those judgments as as quick as you can. Um, you know, that's the way I train. And then you watch someone like Joe Root who literally will just bat for hours. He just bats and bats and bats and he he has his specific things that he works on but he does that with the balls just being mixed everywhere. Um, so I like mine quite specific. He, he'll face bowlers for an hour and then he'll bat for an hour against the dog stick with whoever wants to throw and it'll be a mixture of everything and he just works on hitting the ball and hitting the ball and he obviously has his movements but it's all about volume for him. So does he, in those um, practice sessions, does he work on technical things? Or he does, yeah. He even does. though there's the decision making involved as well because I know a lot of players simplify their practice, they do underarms to take out decision making and it just is then technical. He still makes the decision and works on the technique side of things? He does, yes. Yeah. So that's, so that's something that he does. So I, I obviously don't know what he does in his spare time at, when he's at Yorkshire or with whoever he does his batting work with, but when he's so far since I've been around him in the nets, if if he's not feeling comfortable, he'll go to the nets and try and work it out with the difference in 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 lengths and so on, so that I think he can feel comfortable with it. So I think he he always tries to play the same way with how he trains, with his intent and the shots. He'll never you'll never see him putting shots away in the net. He'll train, and if he's fallen across, he'll play around with the size of his, or the width of his stance, or he'll play away around with the weight in the front of the back, but he still tries to hit the ball on merit all the time. Yeah. Um, which I'm a bit different to, I like to just do my, I like to face the bowlers and do my simple things outside of it, because my bowling's, or facing the bowling's my making judgment calls or that, whereas when I go and do my work, I like to do it specifically. Yeah. Whereas he seems to be someone that likes to do his work specifically, but with people mixing up the length, so he has those judgment calls as well. Yeah. Now, having watched the Ashes quite closely, um, the Aussies targeted you a lot with the short ball. Do you think all the practice you did with the dog stick and the flicker, short stuff, making decisions, ducking, pulling, do you think that that allowed, it obviously allowed you to sort of be calm and in the moment and relaxed as much as you could when you had the ball at 150 clicks coming at you? Yeah, a little bit. I think, I, you know, October I did a lot of, a lot of short ball stuff on the machine. Um, you know, I think the... The biggest issue that you can have when you're playing the short ball is thinking about the short ball and worrying about the short ball. I think if you know that you're comfortable on it and you know that you can play it, I think that's already half the battle won. Um, just because when you're 
at the crease, the last thing you want to be doing is to be thinking about anything apart from watching the ball. Um, you know, so I think you do your training to be as comfortable as you can in the middle. You know, it's never nice facing someone trying to hit you in the head. It's uh, it's quite daunting and quite scary at times. But um, you know, it's if you do your work, you can trust your ability, you can trust your instincts, and you can trust your eye um, to get yourself out of the way of it. So. You know, on life, I didn't say I did a lot of training on it. I, I cranked the machine up to 92, 93, 94 miles per hour and and uh, made sure I was comfortable with that. Obviously, it takes you a bit of time to get up to that. You know, it took me two or three weeks to get up to that. But, you know, it felt like by the time I started facing bowls, they felt a lot slower and, you know, I felt like I, I had a lot more time. And, and that's something that, you know, every batsman is trying to create for themselves to create themselves more time, whether it be with a trigger, whether it be standing still, whatever it is, it's about finding time and making time for yourself. Um, so yeah, but it, you know, it was a great experience facing it, you know, to to stand there, you know, the first test I made a mistake and took, took them on when they went at me. Um, so the second test I made a conscious decision not to take it on and, you know, they got bored after four or five overs and they went back to pitching it up and it was sort of a good lesson for me there that if you, if you, want to do something and you play it badly you're going to keep getting it um, whereas if you make a conscious decision before the game and that's where it comes back to doing your homework the day before and you know what am I going to do what am I going to do if they come around the wicket and they're going to try and hit me in the head what happens if Stark's going to come around the wicket and go up my ribs am I going to play it am I going to leave it am I going to duck it am I um, you know going to show them the respect that he deserves at that time is the situation of the game are we 400 for four and can, I'll probably be able to take him on if we're 50 for 3 or 50 for 4 probably won't be able to take him on because if you get out playing into his hands then it's a different situation so it's all about reading the game, reading the situations and, and I think that does come with your planning and your and your game plan. I think it's amazing to hear um, for everyone listening that you can see on TV what you were going through with the Stark and Cummins and these rapid bowlers bowling short and, and making it really uncomfortable with you but you'd, you'd put yourself in that uncomfortable situation probably indoors um, with no no one around to make sh sure that you felt reasonably comfortable and I think that's a great lesson that's something that we sort of try and encourage all the players we work with that you've got to get uncomfortable in your practice sessions so that it makes you a little bit more comfortable when the time comes. Yeah definitely um, you know I'm, I, I'm a little bit different to, to that to, to some extent so I like to get myself out of my comfort zone for a small period of time in training and then I like to finish on you know, so if I'm doing the machine at 92, 93, and I'm miss hitting a few, and you know there are a few that whizzing past your ears, and you're feeling a bit, bit unsure, I like to then drop the machine down to 80 miles per hour, and then make sure I hit 10, 15 good pulls, so that I know, I know that I'm still comfortable with my shot, I still have the confidence to play it. Because the last thing you want to do is to practice that tough, that you almost lose your confidence in playing, in playing the shots, and. Um, you know, so you train hard when you need to, but make sure, well for me, make sure you finish on things that come natural to you and you make sure you feel good in those areas because otherwise you walk in the game with no confidence and then you're half the battle lost. Absolutely. Now just a few more questions to wrap up. Um, you spoke about switching off and sort of getting away from cricket and it not being everything. What are, what are some things you do to switch off these days now that you're a little bit older and you sort of you've realised there's a lot more to life than I suppose than just cricket. What, what do you do personally? So I really enjoy the cinema. Sounds a bit sad but I really enjoy just you know, there's a cinema five minutes for me, so I really enjoy going to the cinema. A um, bit of golf, like my coffees, so I try to go to coffee shops as often as I can. Um, I've got a little dog in London as well now, so uh, she keeps me entertained quite a hell of, uh, quite a lot. So, uh, you know, I've got to walk her three times a day, and she comes and sits and have coffee with me, and so on. Or we go to the park. So, you know, I find as many opportunities to get out of the house as possible. You know, I think I find when I sit in the house a lot. I sort of start thinking about cricket or you've got the tendency to find cricket on the TV and you end up watching it again. So um, anything to get out, you know, the Middlesex boys all live quite close, so you're always trying to go for a coffee with John Simpson or Finney or whoever's around. So you're trying to make a, an effort to, to be out of the house. And I think that's the key for me is anything that keeps me occupied outside of the house that's not involved the cricket sort of gets my mind away from it. So when you're out, you're obviously trying not to think about cricket at all. Yeah, it's, yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, it's obviously tough for you going for coffee with the dog because the dog's not going to be speaking to you. But, um, you know, yeah, I, I do think it's it's about socialising and about, you know, knowing when your times are, when you can go out and have a good time and let your hair down. And, you know, and as I said earlier in the in the, in the the chat, it's it's about having fun. And, you know, it's when you start 
become when cricket starts becoming everything for you, the pressure that you suddenly start building yourself on and you or put putting yourself under and the amount of times you actually stop enjoying cricket just because you're putting yourself under so much pressure, um, you know, becomes relevant. So, you know, a big thing for me is and it was actually Chris Rogers that, that sort of helped me a little bit with that is was about trying to find the balance in and out of cricket and, you know, we we uh locked horns a few times about it and you know it's it's good you need to be challenged by people um you know because the only way that you'll ever learn is if someone does challenge you and it's the same with your training as we spoke earlier you've got to put yourself out of your comfort zone and you almost need someone to be brutally honest with you every now and again just to put you out of your comfort zone for you to realize that you are maybe not doing the things as well as you could or you're not having that balance that you should have and um you know you you might not like it at the time but you know in the long run it will definitely help Good old Bucky, he uh, always had the balance quite right. Oh, he did. He's, yeah, he's just all-rounded in life. All. <laughs> now, just um, we get asked quite a bit about sledging, how you deal with sledging. Obviously, it doesn't get any sort of harder cricket than the Ashes, and I'm sure there was a lot said on the field. Um, how do you deal with sledging? How do you block it out? And is there, do you have a pre-ball sort of mental routine that you go through to sort of focus your attention again? A little bit. Mine's actually quite stupid, actually. It's, you know, everyone has their own little ways of, of clearing their mind. So, you know, if I play a shot, you know, I like to sort of make a mark straight away or walk away. So I, I have two things. I either make a mark or I play the shot and walk straight away to where a short leg would stand. And as I walk away, I tap. So I'll tap anything I see on the ground that looks weird or standing up or a bit of grass, a bit of grass, I'll just tap it. So every time I've got a negative thought, I almost sort of go, how have you played at that? Or this bloke's bottom quick. Or, you know, watch the ball here, you know, you know, get your feet moving, move a bit later. And then as soon as I tap that last one, I've got my negative thought out of my mind, I like to turn around and go, all right, come on, I've watched the ball, get back to the ball, watch the ball, and walk down, make my mark again, and I'm ready to face the ball. Um, so I try and do that as we go along. Um, you know, it's obviously tough because you're, you're trying to out, outsmart the bowler as well and you're trying to sort of get on top. So it's about also formulating what he's trying to do as quick as possible without sort of dwelling on it, without sort of premeditating what he's doing. So it's almost working him out when you walk away and going, all right, so he's got this field, he's trying to hang it to me here. So what am I going to do? This is my plan so I can move a bit across to off some because if he bowls it straight, it's, it's a free shot for me and the captain's got this field because he wants him to bowl wider probably. So... You know, it gives you the option to sort of think about it, and when I turn around, it's you know, I've made my decision what I'm going to do or how I'm going to approach this bowler, what my game plan is, and then I can just go back, take my guard, clear my mind, and watch the ball. And then trust yourself. Obviously. Trust yourself, yeah. And, and it all goes back down to training. The more you do things in training, you know, the less you second guess yourself. You know, there's times where you can be facing a spinner for argument's sake, and you know, mid on and mid off are up, and you're thinking about hitting over the top, and you actually go, should I? Shouldn't I? haven't really practiced it, what happens if I miss hit it and suddenly all the doubt's there and when you do run down you probably miss hit it. Um, whereas if you're confident in your training and you've done everything that you need to do, um, when you do decide to do something you back yourself 100% you trust your ability and if you get out you get out, that's part of the game um, and you can go back to the nets and you can work it a little bit harder but you know it's about knowing what your game plan is and I've said this before, game plan before you go on, what are you going to do to the spinner if he has mid on mid off up, are you going to run down, are you going to lap sweep him, or are you going to manoeuvre the field, are you going to stay leg side and hit him more offside, or, you know, if the ball's not really turning and he's bowling a straight line, are you going to go offside and try and hit him through the wicket a bit more? It's, it's just about having certain plans before you go and set your mind's clear and you can play instinctively. Yeah, exactly. Trust your instincts, because it's not like you're going to say run down to the opening bowler in a four-day game. It's when your mind says run down, it's when it, the time's probably right. Yeah. It's your instinct. Just last couple, um, having played around the world with some of the world's best players um, playing with and against them, we've spoken about Joe Root and how he practices. Is there anything, any common themes you, you've seen in, in guys that you've played with and against? Yeah, I think the, the, the theme that I've noticed just from being in and around this England team, that the best players, the Cooks, the Roots, they all have a work ethic and they all train specifically for the level they're playing at. Um, you know, in the past I've had coaches come to Middlesex that have been trying to prepare you for international cricket and they're feeding balls to you like you're playing international cricket, but to get to international cricket you have to first master county cricket and county cricket is totally different to facing Stark, Hazelwood and, and um, Cummins. You know, you have to face Murta and 
uh, Chris, Chris Rushworth and Darren David, Stevens. David Masters, Darren Stevens, who will bowl 70 miles per hour or 75 miles per hour and swing it. Um, and, and they test you in different areas. So, you know, it's about working out what the balance is. Do you, and, and it's always, you're always looking at one step ahead that if you're fortunate enough to play for England, um, what, what do you need? So you have to practice both things. And I think watching Root and Cook, they know exactly what they want to do at that level, you know, Cook practices like he's going to be playing test cricket all the time, what he's going to face, the challenges that he puts himself into and the uncomfortable situations that he puts himself into are the situations that he'll find in test cricket and then I can I guarantee you when he goes and plays candy cricket he'll practice what he needs to do at that level. So I think the the level of training changes and the way their games adapt to the level level changes um, and for what challenges they have to accept, uh, they're going to expect. So. Awesome. Now, last couple of quick ones. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? If, if there's, is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, try to be as um, try to be as consistent as you can as a person. Um, you know, I think if if any one of us look back at our careers and you can sort of see the up, ups and downs in our batting and our bowling will come from probably our attitudes as well. So, you know, you don't want to be too high if you're doing well and you don't want to be too low if you're doing badly. Whereas if you're as consistent as you can as a, as a person and, and your personality and your sort of attitude around the game and you can sort of keep that intensity as it should be, um, you know, I think you have more chance of succeeding and and less chance of it, or less, yeah, there's less chance of you being hard on yourself. So um, being as consistent as you can on and off the field, I think is the biggest thing that I've learned. Excellent, and what's next for you? Uh, so 2020 start in a three days time, I think we've got against the Prime Minister 11 up in Canberra. Um, so we've got that, and then we've got the Tri-Series that starts in New Zealand and Australia. And then waiting to find out from the one day series and then test series in New Zealand after that. Awesome. And uh, last question, why do you play cricket? Uh, well, things have changed now. You know, I really play because I enjoy it. Um, you know, it's, I think your goals really change as you go on. You know, my goal was always to play international cricket and now my goals are changing to playing international cricket as long as I possibly can. And, um, you know, that's sort of where I am at the moment and that's, that's what I want to be in, you know, so trying to do that as well as I can. Awesome. Now, where can everyone sort of follow you or find you for those listening that might not have... Is, are you on Instagram or, fa or Twitter? Or? Yeah, on Instagram, Twitter. I don't actually know what the Instagram handles are, but it's on there somewhere if you folks want to find it. All right, we'll it. find it and link that. A few boring that. posts and tweets, and if you want to have a good night's sleep, there's some good reading material. So. <laughs> Darby, thanks very much for joining Cheers, us, mate. Really appreciate your time.